We know by now that batteries are essential to the future of sustainable energy, not just to power our electric cars, but also to store vast amounts of renewable energy from sources like windmills and solar panels. But at the same time, batteries have been a limiting factor in transitioning to sustainable energy. High performing batteries require a lot of money and resources to manufacture. They are very expensive to purchase, and even with the current lithium ion technology, people want more from their batteries. More range, faster charge times, longer lifespans. It's because of these limitations that scientists and engineers are constantly working to build a better battery. So today we are going to cover a few of the bleeding edge battery technologies that could end up being a game changer for the electric vehicle industry and the future of sustainable energy. What if I told you that we could make the most energy dense battery cell in the world out of thin air? I'd be lying because it's not that simple, but lithium air battery technology is the latest breakthrough that could actually change the future of sustainable energy. Stick with me. Scientists and engineers at a United States research center called Argonne are claiming that they have a new battery that has four times the energy density of conventional lithium ion cells. So if the average electric car has 300 miles of range, an EV with these air batteries would then have 1200 miles of range. Or we could not be greedy and just have a battery pack that is only one quarter the size we could get away with 25 kilowatt hour packs instead of 100, which would drive down the cost of electric vehicles drastically. Batteries with this level of energy density could easily power commercial airplanes, ships, long haul trucks, all of the things that we currently think are too big and energy hungry to run on batteries. So how do they do that? Okay, this is where things get a little tricky. As far as we've seen, there are zero simplified explanations on YouTube of how this chemistry works. So we are breaking new ground here. I'm just going to do my best. This is different from the more conventional EV battery cells that we usually talk about here, like Tesla's 4680. In a Tesla battery cell, the cathode is a combination of rare metals, nickel, cobalt, and manganese, and the anode is graphite. In some applications, a combination of graphite and silicon. The flow of lithium ions at discharge moves from the cathode to the anode through a liquid electrolyte and they get stored in the graphite. In the air battery, there is a lithium metal anode and an air-based cathode. So the lithium ions are going to flow from anode to cathode and they're going to move through a solid electrolyte. So this is what's known as a solid state battery, no liquid inside. Air enters the battery from the outside through a catalyst. This is something called a trimolybdenum phosphide. What this does is separate the oxygen from all of the other stuff that's in the air. Specifically, we don't want water vapor to enter the battery. So now we have a cathode full of oxygen atoms. The electrolyte is solid at room temperature, but this material has been developed with internal channels just large enough for lithium ions to pass through. The interior of these channels contain materials that will draw out lithium ions to create stable reactions as they traverse the channel. They are going to jump from one stable reaction to the next until they move through the electrolyte. And an even distribution and high density of these channels along the lengths of the anode are going to allow for a very even distribution of ions. That's going to prevent the clumping of lithium that will occur in liquid battery cells. And this is the main reason that lithium ion batteries lose performance over time. When the lithium ions are drawn through the electrolyte, they break free from their electrons, which flow through the circuit and create an electrical connection. The electrolyte is a ceramic polymer, which is mostly carbon with a lot of oxygen and silicon atoms interlinked. The lithium ions want to interact with the oxygen, and that's what's drawing them through to the cathode side of the battery. Then the lithium ions arrive in the cathode. They link back up with their electrons and react with the air to create lithium oxide, which is then stored in the cathode. This is how the lithium air battery achieves such a high energy density. In a typical graphite anode, the lithium is stored in the porous structure of the graphite, so most of the volume of the electrode is taken up by graphite. In the lithium air battery, the cathode is just lithium and air, lithium oxide. 
and then to recharge the battery, the energy from the charger will split the lithium oxide and push the lithium ions back into the metal anode. And this is where another major advantage has shown up in laboratory testing. These battery cells are incredibly good at charging and discharging without losing performance. We use something called the Coulombic Efficiency Scale, which is a measure of whether any of the battery material becomes inactivated during use by becoming inaccessible or getting involved in irreversible side reactions. And here, even over 1000 charge discharge cycles, the Coulombic Efficiency was 100%, meaning all of the battery's starting material was still active and nothing got lost along the way. Hopefully everything I just said was at least mostly correct. Now it's also important to keep in mind that we are talking about small scale laboratory testing. It's not like they are going to start cranking these things out in large format cells that can power an electric car anytime soon. Elon Musk constantly reminds us making a prototype is relatively easy, but manufacturing a viable product at scale is incredibly difficult. Here is another interesting battery type that is a little closer to reality than the air battery. We are talking about sodium ion, sodium as in salt, and in this application the salt is actually a replacement for lithium. So the implication here is that we could completely remove lithium mining and refining from the battery making process. That is a very big deal, but how does it work? The liquid electrolyte in this case is salt dissolved in a solvent, resulting in charged sodium ions that can transit between the anode and cathode, and in the process, they give up free electrons that power the electric circuit. So sodium ion is basically the exact same operation as lithium ion, just with a different material. And of course, salt is a much cheaper and more abundant material than lithium. And since the sodium acts as a direct substitute for lithium, you can then use it to make an iron cathode battery cell, sodium iron phosphate. Right now, the cheapest and lowest cost battery cell that we have for electric vehicles is LFP, lithium and iron. But in theory, we could make an even cheaper equivalent with just iron and salt, two fantastically abundant materials on the earth. So problem solved? Not quite. Here's the scoop. Sodium ion batteries, similar to lithium, but not the same. For one, they have a slower charge rate, so already that's a problem. People want faster charging than what we have now, much faster actually, so slower charging is going to be a tough sell. And similarly, these cells also have lower energy density than their lithium equivalents. So if we look at the case for a sodium iron phosphate battery, this also gets pretty lackluster. We know that LFP battery cells with iron and lithium have a lower energy density than nickel and cobalt based cells, but LFP is still considered to be good enough, and paired with a highly efficient drivetrain like the Tesla Model 3, and it works just fine. But moving to iron and sodium would be a downgrade in energy density that would probably drop performance to a level that most consumers deem unacceptable. Even so, the Chinese EV maker BYD is reportedly planning on releasing the first sodium ion battery powered electric car this year. It's going to be used in their new Seagull platform, which is an ultra compact car. It's not like one of those Chinese micro cars, but it is pretty small. The standard battery option for the Seagull will be the LFP blade battery that was invented by BYD. This will give the vehicle 405 kilometers of WLTP range. For comparison, a Tesla Model 3 standard in China has 491 kilometers of WLTP range, which is 305 miles. So the measurements are all wonky compared to EPA range. Anyways, the same BYD Seagull equipped with their sodium ion equivalent battery pack will drop down to just 305 kilometers of range. So about 25% reduction in performance. The top speed of the vehicle would also be just 130 kilometers per hour or around 80 miles an hour. So you get what I mean with the performance, just not being up to the level that most customers around the world would expect. It might be fine for China, but those numbers would never sell in the USA. Let's talk about battery manufacturing. The chemistry is only half the battle. It's also very important to look at how we can produce these cells very efficiently at very high volumes. 
So 3D printing could be a significant factor in the future of battery manufacturing. There's a new startup company in San Jose, California that is claiming they have a method to 3D print solid state batteries. The company Saku made headlines in January with their Swift Print technology, which promises to enable production of batteries in custom form factors that may look nothing like today's pouch prismatic or cylindrical cells. They use a method called BinderJet, which was developed by MIT. This first lays down a fine powder of particles and then applies a liquid agent to cure the powder into a solid. These layers would be around 25 micron thick or about one third the diameter of a human hair. This 3D printing platform can print ceramic, glass, metals, and polymer in a single layer, though the company has yet to reveal exactly which materials go into the 3D printed solid state battery. The process is also designed to incorporate artificial intelligence quality checks of every layer to minimize defects and scrappage, and the process inherently reduces waste by only applying necessary material and recycling any excess right inside the machine. With the Saku process, raw materials enter the machine and functioning batteries come out. Very efficient. This allows them to reduce factory footprint by 44%, lower capital expenditure by 23%, slash the number of operations by 69%, resulting in a total reduction in manufacturing cost of 33% compared to traditional battery cell production. But yet again, we have to ask, how close is this to actually powering an electric car? Well, this particular application is making some progress. You won't see a Saku 3D printed battery in a four-wheeled EV anytime soon, but the company is in talks with some electric bicycle makers for products that might come out in the next year or so, and that is actually a fantastic place to start. It will be really cool to see how these batteries work out in the real world, and hopefully that leads to them being able to scale up to larger applications. So there's a little tour around the world of new battery technology. There's definitely a lot of new development on the way, and some of these ideas may even arrive in electric cars at some point in the future. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That is so important for getting our content out to more people. If you enjoy the content, then you'd probably also enjoy our weekly newsletter. So sign up with the link down below at theteslaspace.com. A huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who are listed on the screen now. You help us make the best content we can, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.